We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. Great to see you all here this morning. I want to introduce you to my arch nemesis. I'm holding it in my hand. If anyone has really good eyes, they can tell me what it is. What is this thing? It is a bobby pen. These things are the worst. These will destroy your vacuum in a second. I have three daughters that are all dancers. There's a recital going on today. Uh, and I mean, they're, these things all, all over my carpet, all over my house, all over the floors, they're the worst. I, I can't stand bobby pins. But there's a, there's a reason that we have bobby pins. Why do we have bobby pins? Let's think about this for a moment. So my, my girls at their dance recital later today, they're going to be on stage and they're going to put their hair up in different places and they're going to have a bun or a French twist or whatever those things are. And in order for them to go up and down the stage and spin around and flip around and do all sorts of things rolling all over the stage, and when they're all done, their hair is still going to be right where they put it. It's because they have a hundred of these in each of their hairs. I mean, it's all over the place. And for some reason, when they take them out, the strategy is just to pull them and just drop them wherever they, you know, whatever. I don't know why they can't go back where they found them. So, bobby pins. Well, today, we're starting a brand new series. I want you to think of this illustration of a bobby pin. We're starting this series called Unshakables. And what this series is, over the next eight weeks, we're going to take uh, the essential elements of our faith, the things that as a follower of Christ, we're not willing to bend on, we're not willing to, uh, uh, to, to kowtow, we're not willing to, to adjust, we're not willing to, uh, these are the things that are, these are the hills worth dying on. These are the things that we want the bobby pins of our faith to hold, our, these are the things that need to be held firmly in place. Now I will admit, when we think about theology and elements of our faith, there are certain things that I would say are, are not essential. We may disagree on end times theology, or we may disagree on some element, smaller element of theology, but what we're going to talk about during this series are, are the things that we all should be completely unified on. We should be totally in agreement. And, and to be honest, if you're thinking like, hey, I don't agree with that, we're probably not the right church for you, because we as a church body, we want to be completely united around these truths. And so we're going to go over these, and today we're going to start with, with God. What does the Bible teach about God? Now, here's what's interesting about this. Uh, this whole concept of just talking about God, each one of these weeks could be a whole series, right? I could spend eight weeks just exploring God's word about what it says about God, and yet I'm going to limit this conversation to the 35 or 40 minutes I have on this stage. So what you're really getting is a survey or an overview of our basic theology. You're going to have a basic 40-minute version of what does God reveal about himself in the word about who he is. Now, I'm going to admit that trying to cover each of these topics in 40 minutes is going to be very difficult. You're going to feel a little bit like this kid right here. <laughs> and so I just encourage you, uh, take as many notes as you can write some scripture down, have convers go into these later in, in your life groups, have more and, and greater conversations uh, because we're going to cover this quickly. Uh, but we're, I'm excited about this. In fact, if you actually, uh, one thing about God before we even get into the message today, you know in the Old Testament, there was, uh, there's this thing called the, uh, the tetragrammaton. And you might like, what is the tetragrammaton? Well, well, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew tradition, people didn't want to say the name of God out loud. And so what they would do uh, is, is uh, God's name, we call it uh, uh, Yahweh or Jehovah, they would actually write it Y-H-W-H. -H. 
because it was like, we, we, it, it's not, it it's, can't even really be spoken. It's more like a Yahweh, Yahweh. And it's where we get Yahweh from, okay? And so this, anytime this uh, Y-H-W-H appears in Scripture, the way you're going to see it in your English version of your Bible is the word LORD written in all capital letters. And you're going to notice that right away now, every time you read Scripture. Like, why sometimes is the LORD uh, the name Lord written in all capital letters. And in that moment, you're looking at Yahweh. You're looking at God. Not God the Father, not God the Son, not God the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. You're looking at the, the triune God in that moment. It's who's being speaking or who's being talked about when you see the Lord written in all capital letters. Okay? So let me, let me tell you how we're going to do this series. We're going to, if you go to our website and you look at the what we believe. It's, we call it our essentials of faith. You're going to see different statements on that part of our website. Let me show you the first one you would read. It's about God, all right? I'm going to put it up on the screen in just a moment. It's our big idea statement. And what I want to ask you to do, let's read this together. This is right from our website. This is what we believe the Bible teaches about God. If you are with me here, all right, let's read this out loud. We believe in one sovereign God the creator of all things, who is perfect in every way. God exists eternally in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And through his divine power, God continues to sustain his creation to fulfill his redemptive purposes. Who's with me? All right. So this is what we believe about God. Now, in that sentence, there's actually a couple sentences there. You're, you're going to see some key words. You're like, okay, well, that was great, but how, why do we think that there's one God? Or why do we say that God is sovereign? Or why do we call him the creator of all things? So you're going to notice like there's eight kind of key words in there that we're going to discuss this morning on your, your fill in the blanks. You'll be able to write these in. And I'm going to give you, the, the, again, the overview, the quick version. And by the way, there is no perfect way for me to describe to you all there is to understand about God. That's not possible. All we have access to is what God has revealed to us in his word. This Bible, one of the cool things about it is it's, it's God's love letter to us, but it's a, it's a revelation to us where God is revealing himself to us. He's letting us know what he wants us to know about him. And so while we don't know everything there is to know, there are certain things we can know, and, and these eight things we're going to talk about today are eight things that, these are hills that I will die on. I believe with all of my heart, they describe God very well, and we shouldn't uh, disagree in these areas, all right? So here's the first one I want you to write down. God is one. Now, you might be thinking I'm already talking about this triune oneness of God. I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I'm not talking about that yet. Simply what God's word says is that there is one God. There is one. God is one and only. Let me show this to you in scripture, Isaiah 44. This is what the Lord says. Now, this Lord right here, in your, if you look down at your Bible, you'll probably see all capital letters, L-O-R-D. This is the tetragrammaton. This is God. It says, this is what God says. Israel's king and redeemer the Lord of heaven's armies. He says this, I am the first and the last. There is no other God. You know, my favorite thing is when I open up God's word and I, and I read something and I don't have to open up a, you know, a, a study guide or a, a commentary or some other version of the Bible to understand what it is I just read because something like that is so easy to understand. What does it say? God says, I am the first and I am the last and there is no other God. How many gods are there according to God? There's one. And see, just in that moment, you can see how we're already finding hills that other faith systems would disagree on. We've already divided from other faith systems. I'll, I'll give you one example, right? The Mormon tradition would say that, hey, if you honor God properly and you do all the things you're supposed to do on this life it, it, well enough that one day you can become your own God of your own universe, well, I would say we got a disagreement here because when I read God's word, it says God is the first God, he is the last God, and there is no other God. And so there's one God. 
There's a lot of polytheistic religions that teach there are many gods. That doesn't work with my understanding of God's word. There is one God. God is one. As uh, Moses is explaining some of the miracles as they're coming out of Egypt, this is Deuteronomy chapter 4. Moses says, he showed you these things so you would know that the Lord is God and that there is no other. That, that God is God and that there are no other gods. You know, what's crazy about this is I could keep going. I have a lot of scripture for each one of these points I could point to, but we don't have time. And so this is not an exhaustive list of scripture. It's just a, a little bit of obvious scripture that says, hey, there's one God. And by the way, in James chapter 2, verse 19, it actually shows us that even the demons and Satan know that there's only one God. This is a, an understood fact. There is one God, and that's the hill that we should be willing to die on as a church. All right, number two, we believe that God is sovereign. And you might be wondering, what does that word mean? You've probably heard it in worship songs, or maybe you've, you've heard it mentioned from the pulpit, or like, what does sovereign mean? Essentially, if you look it up in the dictionary, it just means supreme power. So if there's a, a king who's a sovereign, uh, basically what that means is he could look at any person and just say, off with his head. And it's like, well, all right, well, we, king is a king. He's got all, all absolute power. We got to do whatever he says. Well, we understand uh, that when we have that kind of power, it, it's not a good thing. Uh, there's, there's a game I like to play with students in a, when we're traveling on a retreat or on a missions trip. We play this game called silent football. Has anyone ever played silent football before in this room? Heard of it? We've got a couple of hands here. Well, one thing about silent football, uh, there's a, a role within silent football called the, the commissioner. And the commissioner has absolute power in the game. If the commissioner tells someone to stand up and spin around four times, they have to do it or they get out. I mean, the, the commissioner has a lot of power. And the problem is, I, I love being the commissioner. <laughs> Everybody wants to be the commissioner because in our minds, this kind of power, uh, this, it gets scary when you give human this kind of power. But God is perfect and he is sovereign. He's got absolute power. Let's look at scripture. This is um, King David. And King David is about to express and explain uh, about God to us. And by the way, he does this right after, he says this about God, right after donating 112 tons of gold. That's all the gold he has. He donates 112 tons of gold. That's about $6 billion of gold to building the Lord's temple. So David takes the Lord pretty seriously, would you say? And here's what he says. In 1 Chronicles 29, David says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in heaven and on earth is yours, O Lord. And this is your kingdom. We adore you as one who is over all things, wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion people are made great and given strength. The way, the way David's explaining God to us is God not only has incredible wealth and has incredible power, he actually has authority over who has wealth and who has power. He's got authority over those with authority. God is absolutely sovereign. Over all things. He rules it all. All things are his. The Bible teaches this clearly. And as a church, this is another hill that we should be willing to die on. If someone says, listen, I believe in, I believe in one God. But I don't think he's in charge and in control of all things. Like, all right. That's going to, that's going to, we got to break up now, right? It's a problem here. God's word says there is one God. And that he is sovereign. Another way to think about this is what, if you want to write this in the margins of your notes, it's kind of a theology thing. Uh, we, we, we teach that God, that when you're thinking about the sovereignty of God, there's three omni sentences you can write or phrases. God is, the first one is he's um, omnipotent, omnipotent, which means God is all powerful. 
Anything God wants to do, he's strong enough to do it. God is all-powerful. Uh, a, a second one is that he's omniscient, meaning that he is all-knowing. He knows way more, uh, everything there is to know. He knows way more than you. He knows all things. He knows what you're thinking right now because God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. And the third one is that he's omnipresent. Now, a lot of people, when you think about omnipresent, you've probably been taught that this word means that he is uh, everywhere, that he is all, uh, he's present everywhere all at once, right? Is that what you understand? Omnipresent to me. Well, I want to add to your definition of omnipresent. He's not only everywhere all at once, he's also every when all at once. He's outside of space. He's also outside of time. Think about this. Your mind isn't going to have a hard time processing this, but he is equally present right now in time as much as he was at the creation of the world, as much as he is right now at the destruction of the world. God is outside of time. He's, he's above all time and matter and space. He's outside of all of it. So he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, and he's omnipresent. This is, these are words that help us understand the sovereignty of God, okay? Number three, we're going to go through these pretty quickly. Number three is that we believe that God is creator, that he is the reason that everything that exists, exists, that all happened through him. Let me show this to you in scripture. In Genesis chapter one, verse one. Very first book of the Bible, first chapter of the Bible, first verse of the Bible, gets right into the thick of this. This is one of the first theology things you'll learn about God. It says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Who created everything? Who created the heavens? Who created the earth? God did. You don't need to go to seminary to figure this one out, right? God created all things. In John 1, verse 3, it says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. I could show you 20 more verses that declare that God is the creator of all things, in heaven and on earth. Now, what's interesting to me about this specific thing is if, if I were to be asked by someone Hey, what is the greatest bit of evidence you have that a supernatural God exists? That there's something outside of this natural world that exists. And what I would say is I believe that the greatest single bit of evidence of God is actually his creation. The greatest single bit, scripture actually teaches this, that God has actually given us his creation as evidence so that nobody has an excuse to not understand and trust that there is a God. Think about this for a moment. If you tell someone that you have a, a worldview, a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview, that there is a supernatural element to this experience. We live in the natural world, but there's something supernatural that God exists supernaturally. A lot of people in this world will think you're crazy, right? But think about this for a moment. Assume for a moment that you have a naturalistic worldview, that you believe that there is nothing supernatural, there is no God, there is no realm of heaven and hell and angels and demons, that all the supernatural stuff, that's all made up. Imagine you just believe in the natural realm. And therefore, science is, your, is, is, is the thing that you say, listen, there's these laws, and they help us explain how things happen, and the order that they go down, and why things happen the way they happen. And so if that's your perspective, my, my problem with your perspective is that it, it breaks down really quickly because your own laws contradict your, your theory, Right, you have these laws, like let's say like the first law of thermodynamics or the second law of thermodynamics. Your very first two laws of thermodynamics will, will essentially tell you that something can't come from nothing in the natural world. That order doesn't come out of chaos without some sort of control. That these things are impossible. And so you go to someone with a natural worldview and you're like, hey, explain to me if, if there is no supernatural if, if a supernatural worldview is crazy to you and all these things can be explained naturally, tell me where did all this come from? 
And they'll tell you, well, it all came from this explosion. Of, you know, something crashed and there's this bang and boom, everything. Like, all right, well, where did the two things that crashed into each other come from? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, there, there's this energy. All right, well, where did that energy come from? Because you have two laws, and they're not theories, they're laws, that say something can come from nothing within the natural realm. And so I'm telling you, the greatest single bit of evidence that there is a supernatural God is creation. Because creation is, uh, is how you, you look at something ordered and orderly that is that is a clearly got a design and that functions the way it's supposed to and that there's like a system. And you can't look at it and, and say that there's not something outside of it that created it. And so we believe that God is the answer to that question. The single greatest bit of evidence of, of God is, is creation. All right, number four. We believe that God is perfect. Scripture teaches this. Let me show you in Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. It says this about God. It says, he is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. Up, how just and upright he is. See, scripture says that God is absolutely, with zero exceptions, perfect. Now, here's the problem. We throw around this word perfect in our English language, probably far more often than we should, right? If I'm eating some of my wife's chicken divan and she looks at me and says, hey, how's dinner tonight? There's a good chance because I love the meal. I'm going to say it's perfect. And and what I'm really trying to say is I I can't imagine it being any better. It's really, really tasty. I love it. I'm really thankful that you've made it. You know, these are some, some of the things I'm actually trying to communicate. But I bet that Chef Ramsay could come in and be like, well, have you thought about this or this? And then I taste it again and say, whoa, it's even better. Because I, I maybe misused the word perfect. There's probably something else that could be done. I just, I can't imagine it. And so oftentimes we label things perfect, but we have to understand that the God of this universe, the one God, when I say God of this universe, it sounds like there's other gods of other universes. There's not. The, the one God is perfect, absolutely perfect. And as a follower of Christ, that should be a hill that you're saying, you know what, I'm not budging on that. If somebody tries to convince me that that God made a mistake, or God screwed up, or God did this, or no, that's not true about God. The Bible teaches very clearly there's one God, he's sovereign over all, he created all things, and that he's perfect. Those are the first four things we're talking about. Here's number five. Number five, we know that, that God is eternal. We have that in our, in our statement, right? So far it says we believe in one sovereign God, the creator of all things, who is perfect in every way. And then it says God exists eternally. What does that mean, eternal? Let's look at Psalm 90 verse 2. It helps us understand this word a little bit better. It says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting You are God. From everlasting to everlasting. Why? Why the repetitiveness in this psalm? Essentially, these two words mean something different. The first everlasting points all the way back to the past uh, without end. And the other everlasting points to the future without end. Uh, The Bible teaches that God has always been, that he didn't have a beginning, and that he doesn't have an end. And I understand how hard that is in the natural world with our natural brains to process something that doesn't have a beginning or an end. You know, it's actually scary to a lot of people when they think of the concept of heaven. You know, the Bible teaches that if you've given your life to Jesus, that because of Jesus' death on the cross, he's covered your sins. And one day God is going to see you as righteous. And he's going to welcome you into his kingdom. And he's going to have a home for you forever. For eternity. You will live with God. And some of us, actually, I, I've had conversations with each of my kids. They're like, that scares me. Like, scares you. You get to live forever and, 
in a perfect place and just the constant of but forever can be an overwhelming thought for a lot of people. What does that mean? It's just going to always, yes. And it can be hard for us to understand, but the Bible teaches that God, God's even different than you. You did have a beginning, but through Christ, uh, even without Christ, there, there will be uh, an eternity for you, whether that's in heaven or in a real place called hell. God, on the other hand, has no end and no beginning. He is eternal, everlasting to everlasting. All right, number six is where I want to spend uh, uh, more of my time on six than I have on the others. Write this down. God is three distinct persons. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. You're like, you just said that God is one, and now you're saying that God is three. Which one is it, Pastor Matt? You can't have both. Well, I think I can. Let me, let me explain what I mean by God exists as one God made up of three distinct persons. Now, I understand that what I'm about to try to explain is similar to trying to explain rocket science to my dog, right? If you've ever met my dog, she is, she's, she's dumb, <laughs> okay? Uh, she's really not a smart dog. I, I'm sorry, she doesn't understand me when I say that to her, okay? So don't judge. She's not a very smart dog. She's a lot of fun to pet, all right? But she's not a smart dog. She's about six pounds. She's a tiny little thing. If I tried to explain rocket science to her, or to any dog for that matter, I'd be really kind of wasting my time. And trying to fully grasp the concept of this thing we call the Trinity, that there is one God who has eternally existed as three separate persons is very hard for us to understand. So I'm not, my goal today is not to get you to walk away thinking I completely grasp it. Because it's a bit ungraspable. But I'm going to do my best to explain what I see in Scripture about this. So let me explain the Trinity to you. The Trinity concept teaches that there is one God who's existed eternally as three separate persons. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that these three are separate and distinct individual persons that make up a singular God. Now let me highlight first some Scripture that shows how God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are, are distinct, that they're different. Matthew 6, sorry, Matthew 3, actually shows us all three parts of the Godhead in one scene. It's where Jesus gets baptized, and it says this, after his baptism, as Jesus, that's the Son, came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. And so you see in this, these two verses, we have God the Father is speaking to a group of people who just watched God the Son get baptized, right? And then the Holy Spirit comes down and lands on the Son's shoulder. So you see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit separate, distinct from one another. If you were here last week, we covered a prayer of Jesus. Remember, Jesus prayed a prayer to God the Father. There's another example. There's the, the scripture has plenty of examples of Jesus praying to the Father. You're thinking, well, so does that mean God was praying to himself? That's what it sounds like, right? That Jesus was praying to the Father. It sounds like God was praying to God. And I know it can be a little confusing. So let's talk about this a little bit more. How about verses that show their, their oneness? There's plenty of verses that show their separateness. Let's look at their oneness. In Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, remember we just read that? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word God it, it, that you see there in Genesis 1.1 1, 1 is Elohim. And Elohim is a plural noun. It's a plural form of God. And so, wait, that's already interesting. We're saying that there's one God, and yet the very first verse in Scripture gives us a plural understanding of this person of God, which is quite interesting. Let's keep, uh, let's, let's look at a few more examples. In John chapter 1, verse 1, let's also look at verse 2, let's look at verse 14. It says this, in the beginning, the Word already existed. Now, I'm sure you should be asking yourself right now, who is the Word that we're talking about? It says, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He existed in the beginning with God. And then it says in verse 14, So the word became human and made his home among us. And he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So who's the word? The word is Jesus. John's talking about Jesus. And what he says here is that in the beginning, Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. It says that Jesus is with and is. We see the distinctness and the togetherness all in one verse. How about this? It says in uh, John 10, verse 30, Jesus says, the Father and I are one. Colossians 2, 9 says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. What we find out here is Paul's simply saying, listen, in the person of Jesus, God the Son, lives God, Elohim, Jehovah, all in one, God lives in Jesus the Son. Now, we've talked a few verses about the Son. What about the Holy Spirit? How about this? 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God, that God lives in you, and that the Spirit of God lives in you? So you have God living inside of you via the person of the Holy Spirit, according to Scripture. So what do we do with this, right? We have Scripture that makes it seem like God is, is separate, that there's the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit. We have other scripture that says they're all one. What do we do with this? And what, I want to teach you a phrase this morning called systematic theology. Systematic theology is a way of studying scripture to systematically decide what we believe about God, about what he's revealed to him. Now, if you were to take one verse of scripture and just use that one verse alone to decide what you believe about God, you're going to be pulling it from the context of the rest of Scripture and maybe land with a really bad theology. If somebody just read Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, they'll say, well, clearly, I just read it, God is three different people, not one. And then if somebody else goes and reads another verse, they're going to say, well, clearly there's just one God, so there's not any three other things. And, and so you have to take the Bible and put it all together systematically to land at your theology. It, it's kind of like, have you heard that parable of the three blind men or four blind men or however many, and they're walking together and they stumble upon an elephant. They don't know what it is because they're blind, so they, they put their hands out and the first one reaches up and feels the trunk and he feels something moving. He can tell that it's warm and, and that it's about the sh it's cylindrical shape and so he stands there and says, well, hey guys, I just stumbled upon a snake. And the next guy, he reaches out and he, he, he bumps into the, the leg, right? He feels it and it's, it's got some texture to it and it's strong and it's big and it's round and it's touching the ground. He says, well, I just ran into a tree, right? And another guy goes and runs into the, the, the side of the elephant and says, I just bumped into a wall. And the next guy, and everybody's got their own perspective. Everybody is going up to this elephant and they're experiencing a different part but the truth is, if they would just get together, hey, guys, we want to have a little conversation. Well, it's got this, it's got that, it's got this. I, you know what I think? I think we found an elephant. And so what we have to do as Scripture is the same thing. We take it systematically. We understand that there's verses that highlight the uniqueness of the persons of God. We have other Scripture that, that highlights the oneness of, of God. And so what we understand is that Jesus is not the Father, the Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not Jesus. Jesus is not the Father. All, you know, all these, there's a lot of things that aren't. Jesus is not the other two, and the Holy Spirit's not the Father, Jesus, and etc. Et but they're all together part of one triune, tetragrammaton, L-O-R-D, all capital letters, Lord. They're all part of Jehovah. They're all part of God. I know it's hard to, to grasp, but let me, let me try to give you two examples that'll help you understand this oneness. My, my wife and I, we're very unique people. Uh, we have different tastes, right? She likes coffee. I can't stand dirty water. <laughs> um, she likes 
dark chocolate. I like real chocolate. <laughs> Milk chocolate, no. We have different things that we're good at, things that we're bad at, things that there's, there's some overlap. Just like you'll find some overlap with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in their distinct persons. There's, there's a ton of overlap. But the truth is that when, when the Bible says that when my wife and I got married, that in a supernatural sense, we became one flesh. That two distinct, unique individuals became one. And I know what you guys are thinking. You're like, well, every time I see it, it looks like two different people to me. Yeah, there's a supernatural understanding of, of oneness. Another great example is the church. In this room, there's a lot of different people, a lot of personalities. There's people in this room who, who like the Orioles, you know, good call. And there's others of you who just got it wrong, and you're Yankees fans. And so, <laughs> but my, my point is that we're all different. We have different t- tastes and personalities and gifts. But the Bible says that as a church, when you become part of the church, you become part of the one singular body of Christ. There's a supernatural understanding of oneness. And so that's the best I can give you as far as trying to understand this three distinct persons making up one singular God. We call that the the concept of the Trinity. I hope that, that helps. Now, another thing to think about is even in my marriage, right? My wife and I have distinct roles. We both have different parts that we play in our marriage. The same is true about God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Think about this. We know that God is the one with a purpose. He's the one who has a plan. But the Father is the one who sets the purpose. The Son is the one who secures the purpose. And the Holy Spirit is the one who applies the purpose. And so they have different roles, even within the Trinity. Now, number seven, God is a sustainer. He's a sustaining God. It says in Hebrews 1, verse 3, the sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. See, Scripture teaches us that God is a sustainer. Think about it this way. God, when he created the earth, It wasn't just a fun experiment that he did, and he was like, all right, that was cool. Now I'm off to create another universe. No, he is, he's present. He's here. He knows what's going on. Matthew actually teaches that there's not a single sparrow that falls out of the sky without his knowing about it. Scripture teaches that he knows how many hairs are on your head. Now, for some of us, that's an easier calculation. But for some of you, man, it would be a very tough math problem. God knows in this moment, he's, he's so knowing and caring that he, he knows those things. He's a sustaining God who holds all things together. Without his sustaining control, everything would just spin into chaos. God is holding you together and holding everything together. He's a sustainer, according to Scripture. All right, number eight. This one is probably one of my favorites. All these are true. But here's what I love about number eight. Number eight teaches that God is a redeemer. Here's here's what's special about number eight. Number eight now is where you get to see some of the heart and character and compassion of God. You see, we, we understand that God is the one with the purpose, that God the Father is the one who sets the purpose, but Uh, This is an incredible way to close. I want you to know that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. In fact, here's what I want you to know. I'm going to put it up on the screen. God loves you. He has a purpose for your life. He has a plan for your life. He wants to be in a relationship with you. And he wants to redeem you from your lost version of yourself into a saved, restored, righteous version of you. He wants to redeem you. All the way back at the beginning, remember in the garden, when God created the heavens and the earth, have you ever wondered why did God put a tree in the middle of the garden? Some people would say, like, why, why did he put that tree, the knowledge of good and evil? If he hadn't put it there, then everything would be great. We'd all be hunky-dory. We'd be in relationship with God. There would be no sin. It would be all perfect. Why did God put the tree there? Think about that. Here's why. Because love isn't love unless it's freely given. And so he had to put a tree He had to put a choice in the middle of the garden. 
He says, simply listen. Now you get to decide whether or not you love me, don't touch the tree, or you love yourself, go touch the tree. You get to decide. And we all know how that went because we all live that same experience. We're all broken. We love ourselves way more than we should. And we went and we touched the tree and everything fell apart. And yet God could have just said, all right, well, that was a fun experiment. I guess they're all chose to not love me. No, he still loves you and he still wants to be in relationship with you. So he's come up with a backup plan by sending his son to this earth to die on the cross in your place. And he says, listen, I'll tell you what, you, you messed that one up and now you have all this sin and this brokenness. But if you put your faith in my son, who's perfect, he's, he's like, he's, he's part of the Godhead, right? He's perfect. He was there at creation. That God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die on the cross. And if you're willing to put your faith in me, I'm gonna let my death cover your punishment, your sin. And I'm gonna redeem you back to myself. I'm gonna give you a second opportunity to choose to follow me and to love me. Because love isn't love unless it's freely given. God loves you so much, by the way, church, he is not gonna force a single one of you to spend eternity with him. Some people are like, well, if God's so loving, why doesn't he save everybody? He loves you too much to force you to be with him forever. If you don't wanna be with him forever, you don't have to be. He's given you a choice. He's a redeeming God who's given you an option to be restored into a perfect oneness with him. You can do that, but you can choose the opposite as well. What we do know is that God loves you. He loved you when you walked in this room just the way you are. He loves you in this very moment. However broken you are, whatever sin you got going on in your life, whatever issues and doubts you have, he loves you right now just the way you are. Now don't miss this next part, all right? He loves you way too much to leave you that way. He doesn't mean he just accepts you and is, is done with you the way you are. He loves you the way you are, but boy, does he want to do a work in helping you transform into the likeness of his son. So there you have it. Uh, God in 40 minutes. <laughs> um, a very quick overview version. Next week, we're going to talk about the second part of the Trinity, God the Son. We're going to talk about Jesus. What does the Bible teach us about Jesus? What hills are we not willing to, to, to give up? Or are we willing to die on? So as we always do, we, we finish our messages with a simple question, uh, what now, God? This is where you ask uh, God, probably through the leading of the Holy Spirit, God living inside of you through the person of the Holy Spirit. You're asking God, what do you want me to do with this information? And here's a really simple one in this room. If you're in this room right now and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, in fact, I want everyone to ask this simple question, right? The question goes like this. Have you stepped into the redemptive purpose of God for your life? If you've already made a decision to do that, you're my brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, God still has a ton of work to do in you. He wants to continue to transform you into the likeness of his son. But if you're in this room and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, I pray that you don't walk out of these doors today and get in your car and drive off this property without doing something about that because God is a redeemer. He's all these things we talked about. He is one. He is sovereign. He's a creator. He's perfect. He's eternal. He's existed as three separate persons, distinct persons in one God. He sustains your life and he has a purpose, a redeeming plan for your life. I want you to understand and embrace that and step into a relationship with him through his son, Jesus. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity you've given us to kick off this new series. God, I'm so thankful to know that you, that there's only one of you. There's only one God. And God, that you are sovereign, that you have supreme power. And because you are not a human being like us, that power doesn't go to your head. That you created all things, that you are perfect in every way. God, it is such a blessing to know that you are eternal, that you've always existed as three distinct people, that there is a, a sustaining love in you that holds all things together, and that ultimately you have a purpose and a plan to redeem each of us to yourselves. Thank you for these truths that we, we embrace today. As a church, we stand firmly on these truths. These aren't questionable things. We're not wondering about these things. We know these things to be true. 
And so we love you and we thank you for being the God that you've revealed to us in your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.